Welcome deputies and alternates. Thank you so much for coming today. Hope you're all well. Uh, we are moving at the speed of light uh, towards general convention. And today we have Brian Krizlock, the parliamentarian and Ryan Kusumoto, the chair of dispatch of business to give us all a sense of um, where we are in terms of legislative process and the special rules of order for the House of Deputies that we will consider very practically out of the box once we get there um, on, onto the floor for the first legislative session. But before we begin, I'd like to invite the Vice Chair of Dispatch of Business, Emily Malott of New Jersey, to open us with a prayer. Emily? Thank you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, source of wisdom and understanding, be present with those who take counsel in general convention for the renewal and mission of your church. Teach us in all things to seek first your honor and glory. Give us your patient wisdom and creative spirit as we navigate the changes and challenges of this general convention and guide us to share with you in perceiving what is right and giving us the courage to pursue it and the grace to accomplish it through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you, Emily. And before we begin, uh, let me just say that member, uh, we apologize for the delay. We had a little troubleshooting we had to do with Zoom, but I think everybody's been notified and there are well over 200 of you here, which is terrific. Uh, members of my staff, Rebecca Wilson, Sophie Kitchpack, and Kathleen Moore are here. If you have any issues or questions, you can put them in the chat and uh, they will get back to you quickly. So Ryan of Hawaii and Brian of Olympia, the floor is yours and thank you again. Thank you, President Jennings, and, and thank you all for joining us on this uh, morning, afternoon, evening, night, wherever we find you in the world. Uh, so one of the advantages of, of Zoom is you can join a meeting from anywhere in the world. And one of the disadvantages of Zoom is you can join a meeting from anywhere in the world and, and uh, whatever time that might be in your location. So we appreciate you all being here. Um, before we get started, just a couple of quick housekeeping issues. We've got a, a lot of people here. Uh, I'm showing 232 people. So uh, I'd encourage you all or ask you all to make sure your microphone is muted um, unless you're speaking or, or called upon. So I'm seeing a few microphones that are not muted. So if you could please go ahead and make sure that happens so we don't get any background noise or um, <coughs> uh, uh, stray cats and dogs and phones and, and whatnot, um, that would be appreciated. Uh, also, uh, there is a raised hand function. Uh, you'll see that at the bottom of your Zoom screen if you, if you wish to be called upon uh, and ask that you use that. Uh, we'll have a time for questions at the end and it'll just be an open forum to ask whatever questions you have. You can also post those questions in the chat box. So you'll see that also at the bottom of the Zoom. Uh, screen. So there, there'll be some buttons down there, one labeled chat. And then as far as raising hands, you're looking for the button that's labeled reactions. And if you click that, that's where the, the raised hand button will be. So um, so with that, uh, we'll go ahead and dig in. Uh, as, as President Jennings mentioned, my name is Brian Chrislock. I, I hail from uh, Diocese of Olympia. Uh, and I'll be serving, uh, assuming I don't get fired, uh, as the parliamentarian for this convention. So I serve at the pleasure of the, the president. Um, and uh, <laughs> and she's giving me the thumbs up. So uh, hopefully this goes well. Uh, uh, we're, we're here today to talk a little bit about the legislative process for the convention and some of the changes uh, that are coming down the pipeline, you know, some of the philosophies of, of why things are the way they are and, and what we're hoping to accomplish and how our work is gonna be governed. Um, so just to uh, start off with, as everyone is hopefully well aware of now, we've, we've dramatically cut the number of legislative days in the time at convention. So we've, we've gone from almost two weeks down to four days. And, and not only is it cutting it to four days, we're cutting it to four strict days. So in a normal convention cycle, 
you would have, and, and can everyone hear me okay? I just want to make sure. Okay, perfect. Um, in, in a normal convention cycle, you, you might have eight to 10 legislative days, a couple of days of committee meetings, a couple of days of pre-convention gatherings, and you know this, this big, what I would term uh, Episcopal family reunion. And I'll be honest, I'm a nerd. I love these. <laughs> I love the full convention experience. It's my favorite thing. It's why I do this. Um, and uh, it, uh, it, it's just an incredible representation of the church and all its diversity and people. And uh, it, it's a huge family reunion. So it's hard. It, it's hard to go down to the, the four days. Um, and one of the reasons why we did that is, is in light of, uh, I think, the, the first and, and primary mission of the church is to care for, for members of God's family and, and the people of the church. Um, four days was not a number that was picked out of the blue. It was not just selected because we thought X, Y, Z. It was given to us as the way to minimize, based on the best medical evidence, the way to minimize the number of cycles of infection. So it, as we've all learned in the pandemic, if, if, if someone becomes infected with COVID, then they'll go infect others. And then there's an incubation period and then they'll go infect others. So, so four days was really selected in consultation with uh, medical experts to say, okay, what's the most amount of time we can do because we've got a lot to do and there's a lot on our agenda, um, but at the same time, balancing the health and safety of our participants. So that's where the four days came, comes from. And, and the actual selection of the days was balanced out by both the needs of, of our pre-existing contracts, how the hotel contracts worked, and also uh, keeping in mind, you know, can we help try to minimize some of the impact? As a layperson, I, I appreciate this, try to minimize some of the impact to lay individuals in terms of vacation and time off from work and all of that, as well as kind of looking at it. So that's resulted in us having to cut a lot, you know, come, coming from that two week period to a four day period. Um, and we, we've had to make some pretty dramatic changes. And uh, you'll see those proposed changes in the rules of draft special rules of order that uh, uh, Rebecca has posted in the chat if you haven't seen them. And they were also included on email. Um, it, as we approach this work, I want you all to keep in mind that this is not a normal convention. The goal of the four days, the goal of this convention is not to do what we normally do in two weeks and four days. And it's just, let's, let's, on, let's, let's name that. We're not gonna get everything done. We're not gonna do what we normally do. And I don't think to some extent, should we do what we normally do? In part, that's because of the limitation of people who can attend. There's a lot of deputies who cannot attend uh, from certain provinces. Some of that is completely outside of our control. It has to do with entry requirements to the United States in light of COVID protocols, um, concerns over infection, all of that. I mean, so we don't get the full convention here. And, and so to have the full discussion, reflection, discernment, and voting that we normally would have, the participation of outside groups and other partners in ministry, are, we don't have that. And so looking at our work and saying, okay, we're going to try to do everything we normally do, I, I, I don't think is entirely fair to our normal discernment process and, and governance process. So uh, the goal here is not to do what we normally do. The, the goal is to try to identify key pieces of legislation and work that needs to be accomplished now. And it's not saying the other stuff isn't important. It's just saying we can't deal with everything now. So what do we have to deal with now at this convention? And what can we deal with when we have the time and the opportunity and the full kind of gathering of, of the church at the 81st General Convention? So, so that's kind of the philosophy under undergoing those rules. So that takes us to uh, the special rules of order um, for the House of Deputies. So just as a quick reminder on the legislative process and how these rules work. Um, each, we are a bicameral legislature. So we, we have a house of bishops and we have a house of deputies. And in each house, each house adopts its own rules of order to govern its work. The, we can't tell the bishops how to do their work and the bishops can't tell us how to do our work. It's, it's, we have our own identities and our own um, processes in place. Uh, these rules are proposed rules for the House of Deputies, which govern a lot of the House of Deputies specific rules, and, and the bishops will have their own proposal and to deal with this shortened convention. 
the rules that exist in the, uh, and you can find these on the General Convention website, or if you have a paper copy of the Constitution and Canons, um, in the back of the Constitution and Canons, those rules exist as standing rules of the House. And they remain in effect unless they're suspended or repealed by the House. So in, in this particular case, what we are proposing is a special rule of order, which would override the standard rules to the extent that it conflicts. So in essence, this proposal that, that's posted in the chat and, and was emailed to you would override the standard rules of order in the House of Deputies. So you would want to look at this first in the event of a conflict. This is the one that controls for this convention. So it's limited to this convention and it's limited to this purpose. Um, and what we tried to do is capture this in a way that is easy to follow for everyone. So it's just one document you're looking at instead of 15 different resolutions and whatnot that you can just point to this document. So we'll kind of tackle some of the, the big changes in here. This will be the first one of the first items, probably not the exact first, but one of the first items on the agenda at convention on the first legislative day. So when we do our organizing resolutions, we adopt our calendar, we elect certain key officers um, and appointments. Um, this will be part of that process. So before any other resolution is considered, we'll, we'll be voting on this. Um, a couple, just to kind of start tackling through it, a couple of big changes. So um, you'll see uh, in the, rule we've kind of tried to divide it up but i wanted to point out we'll, we'll go ahead and start with the uh, committee work um so the biggest change is that these rules change some of the rules in the house of deputies um normal procedures and allowing committees basically validating what the committees have been doing, which is their pre-convention work. So having there's no provision in the current rules of order to have pre-convention hearings. There's no provision in the current rules of order to have electronic meetings that far in it. Well, there's opportunity to have meetings that far in advance, but not to actually vote or make decisions. So we've included a provision in here that says, okay, all this committee stuff, because committees aren't going to have a chance to meet at convention, all this committee stuff that has been done over the last six months is going to be validated in valid actions. Um, that's a big change. And, and the reason why we're doing that is, I think, a couple of things. One is we're not going to have guests, visitors, third parties at convention who could normally testify for, a con for before a committee. I mean, because we've had to limit the number of people who can come. So by allowing the electronic hearings, we've opened that up and tried to accommodate the individuals who can't come and they can participate in the process. Um, and, and Janet, uh, I, I see your comment. Uh, there, it should have been included on the reminder email you received for, for this meeting. There should be a link to it. Um, so uh, with respect to participation, having electronic hearings really allows broader participation. And in some respects, it uh, offers even broader than you would normally have at a convention because individuals who can't afford or can't take time off to, to travel can, can sign up and testify at a committee. So by allowing that, we've kind of, we don't have the in-person hearings, but we're allowing the same people to, uh, to participate, hopefully. Second thing is it's gonna really allow us to hit the ground running because by getting the work done, getting the recommendations done, uh, we're going to arrive at convention, um, and, and you'll hear Ryan talk a little bit about this in a, a few minutes, uh, with a completed calendar, ready to go. We're, we're going to know what the committee recommendations are. We're going to know what the legislative calendar is looking like. We're going to see all of that before we arrive. So we're not going to have, in, in some respects, we're not going to have that normal kind of chaotic process for returning deputies where you're showing up in two or three days, you don't know what's happened when, and it's 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 all over the place. So, so we're going to have that legislative calendar in place, and, and you, as a deputy, um, are going to be able to know kind of what's coming down the pipeline and plan accordingly. And, and that's going to really hopefully let us focus uh, so we're not having to ramp up our legislative calendar the way we would in a normal convention. Because oftentimes what will happen is the first two or three days of convention are spent in committee hearings, so we're waiting for legislation to get out of the committee before it's 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 presented uh, to the whole house. So um, the other piece is that we are limiting committee meetings at the convention 
to only those things that are necessary for completing um, what are known as kind of review of floor amendments from the other house. So kind of going back to being a bicameral legislature, what happens is each resolution is assigned a house of initial action, which basically means, okay, we've got a resolution. Who votes on it first? Do the bishops vote on it first or do the deputies vote on it first? So if a resolution goes to the bishops and then the bishops on the floor, just like they, we could do on our floor, if the bishops vote for an amendment, our legislative committee, the House of Deputies Legislative Committee needs to consider, okay, do we recommend this amendment or do we disagree with this amendment? That's, that's when committees would need to meet at convention. So all their pre-convention work, all their pre-convention resolutions, all their pre-convention recommendations are done before convention. The only time they would need to meet is if they need to consider something that the bishops did on the floor. And so, uh, oftentimes these are just minor amendments, you know, clerical changes, small changes. So there's not the need for a substantial meeting. But in the event that there is a, a major change, like a, a philosophical difference between the two houses, um, then the committee would, would have an opportunity to meet and consider and make its recommendation and potentially change the work it did beforehand. Um, so that's that's the piece. Uh, but we're, uh, that, that's kind of an overview of committee work. Um, and I'd also note that every resolution will still have a hearing, whether it's, you know, we're, we're still preserving that requirement. We're just making them, making them electronic. Um, so the next piece is, is the resolution cutoff deadline. Uh, and that's that's in section three of, of the uh, special rules. So the resolution cutoff is going to be, um, we, and, and this was previously announced, but we recommend, we're recommending that it's June 6th. That allows the committee an opportunity to kind of consider what it needs to do and vote on it. And, and this is, a, again, a big change as we're used to normally having it being the, the second legislative day of a convention. Um, so, all resolutions are in the hopper decided um, and the practical side of that is we just don't have the opportunity to um, uh, the opportunity to uh, kind of have that normal time set aside at the convention. Um, the next item uh, we're going to talk a little bit about legislative calendars. So this is another big area that we're changing. Normally, the legislative calendar for each day in the way the House of uh, um, uh, the House of Deputies calendar works is we we don't do daily calendars anymore in the sense of we don't say okay this is everything we're going to consider on July sixth we have one legislative calendar and, and that calendar is a list in order of all the resolutions that we're going to be considering. And dispatch is the one, um, and dispatch is, is the committee that really is charged with that and appointed. It's a legislative committee that's full of deputies. It's appointed by the president for this role, and it has representatives on all legislative committees. So they're the only committee out there that is basically has its fingers in every other legislative committee to know what's going on. Um, they're tracking everything. They're paying attention to everything. Their job isn't to validate the merits of things, their job is to look at, okay, we've got a limited amount of time, we've got a legislative calendar, how best should we sort through all the work that needs to get done? And, and that's their charge. Um, uh, the legislative calendar is normally set the day before. Uh, we have changed that in this proposed rule to uh, public, be published at least 12 hours in advance of the session. So in the current agenda for the convention, we're anticipating potentially three sessions a day. So we wanted to preserve some flexibility um, that if, for example, we needed to consider something in the afternoon or the evening of the next day, dispatch would be able to update that calendar accordingly. Um, so that way we, we can preserve um, the notice requirements, but also have that flexibility without needing to uh, needing to uh, vote to suspend the rules. The other thing we're doing is, is the consent calendar will be considered twice a day instead of once a day. So in the morning and the afternoon sessions. Um, and then uh, we will also, we're also changing some stuff with respect to the consent calendar. So let's, let's talk about that because that's a big thing. For those deputies who are new, 
the way a consent calendar works is um, the consent calendar is a list of every resolution that's been put on this calendar um, and is then voted on. And when the House votes on it in one vote, the House is voting to adopt the recommendation contained in the consent calendar. So if, if the committee recommends adopt, the con a vote adopts that recommendation. If the committee recommends refer to a CCA and a B or reject or take no further action, that's, that's what happens to that resolution when the consent calendar isn't adopted. In a normal convention cycle, we have uh, uh, a process in place where any three deputies can remove an item from a consent calendar or the legislative committee can remove the item from the consent calendar and, and some other individuals. We've changed that and, and we've put a more restrictive approach to that. And part of that has to do with the fact that when we looked at the schedule and everything that needs to get done, we don't have a lot of time. I mean, we there's certain things we can't do on the consent calendar, like uh, we cannot pass a second reading of a constitutional amendment on the consent calendar because it requires a vote by orders. We cannot pass certain resolutions that require a two-thirds vote on the normal consent calendar. And we might be able to do a special, but I mean, there's just a lot of things. We can't do elections on the consent calendar. I mean, so all of these things, if we look at the schedule, take a lot of time and, and we don't have a lot of time. So what we're asking everyone to understand with the consent calendar this cycle is pulling something off of the consent calendar is not really pulling something off to debate it. It's pulling something off because the House needs to do something different than the committee is recommending, whether it's an amendment, reject a resolution, uh, uh, propose a referral to a CCAB, propose deferral, do something other than what the legislative committee is recommending. That's the purpose of pulling things off the consent calendar. And all resolutions now will go on the consent calendar unless they're pulled off by the um, uh, unless they're pulled off by the uh, House by a one third vote. And we adopted a one third vote requirement because that's or one third plus one. But that is the same vote that would be necessary that could kill. There's some symmetry to this, so let me explain it in the right way without getting too confusing. But basically, a, a vote to in debate requires two thirds. So we we selected the one third number because there's some symmetry saying, okay, if the House wanted to debate something, one third plus one could continue debate on something until until it's done. So that's the why the one third was was selected. Um, and uh, the committee on dispatch and uh, the president can also remove items from the consent calendar. So what I'd like to do is, is, is call on Ryan here to talk a little bit about how dispatch is gonna approach the consent calendar and calendaring, and then you know, recommendations in terms of talking to dispatch about getting something removed. So go ahead, Ryan. Thanks, Brian. Um, I just wanna maybe double down on some of the things you said earlier. You know, we're going to do our best um, and say we dispatch is going to do our best to really build this legislative calendar um, and the consent calendar for the House of Deputies in advance, you know, on or slightly after June 25th when everything is filed by, by all the committees. Um, we will essentially get a good picture of what um, the calendar might look like. And we hope to publish that calendar uh, before you all get the, to general convention in Baltimore so that you can see what's what's coming up for um, for our legislative session. And presumably we'll be able to do this for about half of the resolutions because we can do this for the resolutions that um, begin to, in the House of Deputies, the ones that are um, the, the resolutions that are um, for the House of, that reside first in the House of Deputies. The other half that go to the bishops where the bishops are the House of Initial Action, we will start calendaring those once the bishops enact those and that will happen throughout general convention. But presumably half of the resolutions will be calendared by the time you get to general convention and you can see that in your rebinder. Um, again, we're going to do our best to move these resolutions either through the consent calendar or the legislative calendar and to Brian's point about time compared to previous general conventions, we have about 45% less time in legislative session than we did in the previous one. That being said, we also have 45% less resolutions from the previous general convention. But having less days also is a limiting factor to us. So we're really gonna to try to work hard to push, push these through. Um, we also have some things that I just wanna make you guys aware of um, that we are also, uh, that will cut into some of that time. Brian sort of alluded to that. We have some 
like day one organizing the elections, the budget um, announcements, and, and that all takes up a significant amount of time. And so we're probably left with about maybe 16, 17 hours to deal with the rest of the resolutions that might come before us. Is so what sort of a number we're predicting. Um, I also wanna highlight the fact that there are gonna be some um, special orders for the house that we are gonna put forward. The presiding officers working group on truth telling, healing and reckoning. We will be putting forward those resolutions to the floor of the house um, to discuss um, as a special order, as well as the House of Deputies Committee on the State of the State of the Church resolutions will also come before the House. And again, as Brian mentioned, the other ones that will come to the floor that we know of for sure are the budget um, and resolutions with constitutional amendments or those that need vote by orders or two thirds votes. But that being said, um, we're going to be working with the committee chairs on the rest of the resolutions. Um, and the committee chairs have been given guiding principles about how to prioritize their resolutions. Um, and they're looking at wh how, what's, you know, is this a necessity for, um, to do this now, or can it wait to the 81st General Convention? Um, and they're using those guiding principles to determine um, how best to move it forward out of those committees. From there, we will gauge with the chairs, um, when I say we, dispatch will gauge with the committees and the chairs to decide how best to put it forward to general convention, whether it be a floor item or whether it be part of the consent calendar. And again, there's a many, many factors that could come into that. Could be based on the, the amount of debate it had in committees um, or other factors that um, the committee chairs might be expressing with us. Now, dispatch committee will be meeting every day, likely twice a day to make sure that we are continually building the calendar as we go along. Um, because we have that 12, 12 hour window to post um, updates to the calendar. Um, we, we don't have the exact space and times yet, but when we do, uh, we'll make sure that you're, uh, you'll know. We also probably set up a, um, a email address um, that you can contact us on because there might be some situations where you want to let us know about a particular issue or matter um, and that we can consider it versus it having to come to the floor. And what I mean by that, Brian talked about pulling something from the floor, I'm sorry, pulling something from the consent calendar that takes a one third vote. Um, if it's a matter that maybe the committee, for example, um, had another discussion and wanted to um, pull it from the consent calendar, but it's already in the system, um, they can have a conversation with dispatch and we could likely pull that from the consent calendar. And that saves us some time from having to do a one third vote on the floor. So there might be opportunities for us to have conversations in advance to, to uh, make the legislative process a little bit more um, smoother and allow, allow for more time for us to deal with all the resolutions. So we'll make sure that that's available to all of you. In the meantime, you can also just contact Emily or myself um, and we will uh, put our, our emails in chat um, and you can let us know if you have any questions on that. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Ryan. So just to kind of recap, uh, the big changes to the consent calendar are uh, we've limited who can remove an item from the consent calendar. It's now a one third vote on the floor or one third plus one. Uh, the committee on dispatch or the president. So if there's an item that you want to re be removed from the consent calendar, as you look at that, as it's published, talk to dispatch. That should be your first go-to. So talk to Ryan and, and Emily and, and they can present it to the uh, committee and, and uh, have a conversation with you on that. Um, and that's a big change, and we know it's a change. The, the reason behind the change is to really make sure we can get through the, the legislation that we need to get through. And, and just as, as Ryan mentioned, we've got 45% less. That's with three sessions a day, evening sessions. That's cramming a lot into a short amount of time. And whether it's a 10-day or a, a four-day convention, there's certain things that just eat up the time no matter what. So, um, and we, we don't have a lot of control over that because of, of the nature of, of how things um, have to get through the convention. So um, really, 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 we want you to be judicious with, with the consent calendar and, and that approach. Um, and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, keep going. Uh, the next item is uh, some changes to uh, debate rules and amendments. So we're proposing a process. This process has been tested. It, for those of you at the uh, 79th General Convention in Austin, you may remember this on certain special uh, 
special orders of business, uh, and we found that it worked really well. Um, so we're adopting this for all resolutions at this convention, just to in an, in an effort to expedite the process and just make it more free flowing. One of the things we notice that happens oftentimes is um, during debate on resolutions, a lot of amendments and rules and who gets to the microphone first all, all become major issues. And, and we don't want to necessarily encourage people to rush to the microphones uh, to get called on to make a motion. And we don't, and, and you know, there's some mobility issues sometimes that individuals have that they can't necessarily do it. It takes them out of the process. We're trying to come up with a way that uh, values two things. One is a deputy's right to make an amendment or propose change to a resolution. And the second is the, the smooth operation of the house, that how do we make this process as smooth as possible? So we're not trying to take anything away, we're just trying to structure it in a way that, that can flow. Um, so uh, with that, we're proposing a structure for debate. We've, we've set the debate limit to 20 minutes on any resolution. And this applies to resolutions that come to the floor. It doesn't apply to the consent calendar, which is not debatable, but resolutions that come to the floor. Um, 20 minutes is the cap. We're, we're still preserving the six minute, no move to in debate substitute unless no one wants to speak up. So if, if a resolution comes to the floor, no one wants to speak on it, we just move to, or, or no one wants to amend it, we just move to a vote on it. But if there is some debate or some concern um, about the resolution, we're still preserving the right of deputies to do so. And then the president can in debate immediately if, if no one is seeking to take the opposite side. So if we get three speakers in favor of resolution and no one wants to speak against it, uh, President Jennings uh, has been very active in ending debate, which is allowed to under our rules. Um, same thing if everyone's speaking against it and no one is speaking for it. Um, after that first six minute kind of buffer zone, we're, we're gonna consider amendments that are pre-submitted only. So if you want an amendment to a resolution, you need to pre-submit that amendment starting July 5th to the Secretariat. And we wanted to include a date there that everyone can submit it. You don't have to submit it in person. We're not expecting you to submit it in person, honestly. Um, you can email it to the Secretariat and information will be posted on how to do that. But amendments will need to be pre-submitted before the session that the resolution is considered. And we're doing this for a couple of reasons. One is, and amendments will be considered in a first come first serve basis. So the earlier you get your amendment in, you'll be first on the queue when it comes time to consider amendments on the resolution. Uh, this allows time to uh, uh, deal with the translation. So we're not spending a lot of time to make sure interpretation is happening for this amendment. It reduces confusion and make sure it's in the legislative V binder. So when it's considered, everyone can see it and knows exactly what the proposed amendment is. Um, and it also preserves a, a kind of an expeditious uh, consideration of the resolution. So we're not dealing with uh, a lot of floor time spent. I'm proposing this, that back and forth. We just want everything lined up, queued up, ready to go. Um, uh, so the uh, proposed process will be resolution is introduced, we debate for six minutes on the resolution itself, then we consider amendments in the order that they're pre-submitted automatically. Um, and debate on the amendments is limited to, uh, I, I believe it is uh, four minutes. Uh, so we'll, we'll have four minutes to debate the amendment, yes or no, and then we move on to the main resolution or the next amendment. Um, if you pre-submit a resolution or amendment and decide to withdraw, make sure you do so. Uh, we don't wanna take a lot of floor time on that. But the whole idea is we're, we're trying to get everything lined up so it's clear what's happening for everyone and we're not having to spend a lot of time on the floor trying to sort through what's happened. We, we want things organized and we wanna preserve everyone's ability to participate in the process. So it's, it's balancing both. It's not designed to control the process, it's designed to really make it clear and, and, and uh, ensure that everyone can understand what's happening. A um, Couple of other quick uh, changes to the, the normal motions. Uh, we, we've tweaked uh, when the motion to recall from a committee can be voted upon and that's uh, on the second uh, legislative day. And then we've also eliminated debate, uh, which was a gap in our rules that we needed to fix anyway, um, but we'll, we'll do it permanently next time. 
but we didn't think it was good to debate whether or not we should limit or extend debate, <laughs> which turned into what, what did I say? I, I think it was a 30 minute conversation about whether we should extend debate 15 minutes <laughs> did not seem to be a judicious use of our time. <laughs> uh, so it's that, that's also in, in the proposed changes as well. Um, coupled with that, uh, we, we have introduced a new resolution or a new motion for this convention, which is basically a deferral to the 81st General Convention. And there's a couple of things. One is uh, we felt like it was important uh, for everyone to understand that consideration at this convention is not really a question about whether or not this is an important resolution or, or whether or not the merits of the resolution are important. It, it, the decisions we're making have nothing to do with the value of the resolution. They have to do with our, uh, the time constraints, really. And so because of that, we wanted to introduce a mechanism that really recognized this is not a normal convention. This is a convention that's limited because of extraneous circumstances. So the deferral to the 81st General Convention is really a motion that can be brought on the floor, which basically says, this is an important topic. We're not gonna kill it the way a, a normal non-consideration, like if we normally don't consider a resolution, that resolution is killed, it dies and then would have to be reintroduced. We're gonna say, we're going to honor this work and we're going to move it to the next convention where we will have more time and a more a fuller opportunity to consider it. Um, the committee can vote to defer and we're encouraging committees and some guidelines were published on, on that to the committee chairs, but a, a committee can vote to defer, the committee on dispatch can vote to defer, and um, the House can vote to defer. And it's essentially a, a way to kind of say, okay, we're gonna take this and we're gonna consider, it will be considered, it will be considered as it was submitted, um, any notes or work will be transmitted, but, but the final action on it and the final vote on it will be in, in, uh, at the 81st General Convention. Um, the House always has the right to suspend the rules and, and override that deferral. Um, but uh, it, in order to not take up floor time and, and deal with it, we've, we've introduced this, this motion to uh, defer. And uh, I'll just go ahead and mention, or I'll call on Ryan to see if he has anything to add on, on deferral. Uh, not, not too much, Brian, just that, um, you know, I think the committees, if some of the committees are actually working and voting on deferring some of the resolutions and they're, they're using sort of their priority list to determine that maybe because uh, they feel that there needs to be more time to debate that particular resolution um, and they, or maybe they need um, more voices at the table for that particular resolution. So they're already making some of those decisions to defer to the 81st General Convention. In all likelihood, if dispatch makes a call on um, deferring a resolution to the 81st General Convention, it, it's really driven mostly by time um, and the ability to be able to bring um, resolutions, all resolutions to the to this general convention. And we, we, we likely won't be making that call without having a lot of conversations with that committee um, and the president of the House of Deputies. So we, we um, will be in conversation if this, if dispatch makes that call, uh, it'll likely be after extensive conversations with that, with that, um, with that committee, as well as the president. Thank you, Ryan. And then the, the final final piece has to do with elections. Uh, there's not too much of a difference in the election rules. Uh, elections will be conducted um, uh, as uh, under normal circumstances, but there is changes to the timeline and the process uh, for nominations. So one is that all nominations will be submitted, have to be submitted to the secretariat. Um, by uh, 12 noon, except for the election of vice president. And, and I'll mention that for in a second, but by 12 noon on the first legislative day. So um, if your office is one that required a background check, you will have to have completed that already. Um, and, and you should know who you are um, if you're running for that position. Uh, but, uh, and for other offices, 12 noon. So there won't be a time set aside on the floor to accept nominations from the floor. This is the nominations from the floor process. It will be through the secretariat uh, via an email. 
Um, there won't be any floor speeches or anything uh, of that effect. Uh, the election of all offices except for vice president of the house will take place on the uh, morning of the second legislative day. So after uh, uh, opening worship and uh, items we'll be doing, we'll just go through all the elections. Um, we will then accept nominations for the office of vice president of the house. And the reason why we have to do it this way, if you haven't attended convention before, is uh, the president and the vice president have to be from different orders. So if the president is a lay person, uh, the vice president has to be in the clergy order and vice versa. So we can't really accept nominations for vice president until the president has been elected. Um, so once that has taken place, Nominations for the Office of Vice President will be submitted by uh, 6 p.m. on the second legislative day, so that afternoon, and then the election for Vice President will, will take place on the third legislative day, the, the morning of the third legislative day, <clears throat> um, or I'm sorry, in the afternoon session on the third, third legislative day, uh, and then nominations will be published by the, the Secretary. Uh, so the, the process, the voting, all of that's governed by our normal rules. The only thing that's changing is, is the timing and, and submission of nominations on that. Um, and that, that kind of wraps it up. The, the one final thing is, you know, these are, these are special rules of order. They're intended to be responsive to the conditions we're in um, and to keep that in mind as, as we, we talk and work through these. So, um, we'll go ahead and open it up for questions, unless, uh, Ryan, you have anything else to add that I missed um, that you wanted to say? No, I think you got it, Brian. Okay. I'd, li I'd like to suggest um, answering out loud some of the questions that were posed in the chat also. Sure. Would someone want to be the stand-in for, for the questions? Uh, Emily, would that work for you? And I see Sarah has her hand up. so. Let's go ahead and start with her. And then Emily, if you wanna go through and ask those questions and then. Uh, thank you so much for all the work, um, first of all, that your team has done and um, really appreciated the thoughtfulness that's gone into this um, on such short notice. So I'm Deputy Sarah Lawton from Diocese of California and also a member of Legislative Committee 9 on Racial Justice and Reconciliation. Um, and just to say on that one, we understand that the presiding officers um, working group resolutions on truth telling reckoning and healing are already probably slated for a special order. And we're working really hard to get as much of the rest of the agenda that we support onto the consent calendar um, under the understanding that if we don't put it on the consent calendar that there's a strong chance that it will be deferred or die and I just want to ask if you believe that to be true because i'm witnessing other committees taking legislation that they evidently support but feel like maybe it might be controversial or maybe um it should have a conversation and I, I, my, my heart is is racing because i think well that probably might mean that it will end up either being deferred or or that it might even just never come up and i just wonder if you have a sense of I know you said 16 hours, um, just how seriously we should be taking this, um, this admonition to get as much of the agenda that we support um, onto the consent calendar from our legislative committees. Uh, oh, go ahead, Brian. Oh, go ahead, Ryan. And then, yeah, Sarah, thanks for raising that. You know, it's, it, it, this is a, a different general convention. And I think um, in, in the past, um, in the in the previous general conventions, just just from a real time perspective, and you can gauge based on those who have um, been here uh, at previous general conventions, typically about forty percent of the resolutions that we we had would come to the floor. Um, th this general convention, um, because of the the limited time and the days, um, it, it forty percent of the resolutions uh, it just wouldn't be possible for us to bring those to the floor. We're projecting maybe anywhere from about um, at the low end, 12 to maybe about 20% of those resolutions can come to the floor. And so with, with that in mind, we're talking maybe about, you know, maybe perhaps two to three resolutions from every committee on average that could possibly come to the floor, if, if that at all. It just depends on the amount of time um, uh, 
resolutions may take. And so, Sarah, to, to answer your question, I think that's a tough one. Um, you know, we, um, you know, I, I think if you can gauge based on your committee, if um, if they have flowed through the committee in a particular manner, um, I think they could definitely go through the consent calendar for that purpose and get it through this general convention. Um, but if if there is a another desire, I would say please contact um, Emily and myself, and we can try to work through those particular individualized issues that you guys are seeing um, for those resolutions. And just to add, you know, just as a reminder, one of the differences in, in the way that the consent calendar is being managed this time is everything goes on the consent calendar, unless it can't, um, or dispatch removes it. So the legislative committees aren't need to have the conversation with Ryan and Emily about items that they want removed potentially. And, and we did it for exactly that reason that Ryan mentioned between 12 and 20% of resolutions can make it to the floor and um, we want to honor the work that of, of committees that want to get it done this year. Um, and uh, we have a limited amount of time. And, and that doesn't even include, and some of those calculations presume I, what I would say is efficient elections. Um, we, we do have a number of candidates for certain offices, so it might require multiple ballots. Um, and the special orders that, that we're going to have some time set aside for certain resolutions to go more in depth. Um, and, and debate set aside for those. So, so that all eats into the legislative time and what is available. By the time we add all of that in, we're probably not even gonna start legislation until the afternoon of the, uh, the first legislative day. So that's an entire morning that's spent orientation, training, dealing with organizational stuff. Um, so it's, th there's a really limited amount of time. So, so that's why we're really trying to manage the calendar in a way that lets the convention uh, operates smoothly. Uh, Mary. Thank you. I have a, a couple of questions that go back to the um, nominations and elections. As of now, we have, you said that they must be, um, the president and vice president must be from different uh, orders and am I uh, clear that it's must or is it tradition? Must. It's it's a canonical requirement. It is a canonical. So at this point, the only viable candidates for president are lay. No, uh, the president is elected first. So either, and we have candidates who are both lay and clergy running for president. Then, uh, okay. then. So the, the offices of president and vice president require a background check and right. number of individuals, when you submit your information for a background check, that just clears you to run for any office that requires a background check, not necessarily just one office. Right. right. Um, so I believe we have one announced candidate who's clergy for vice president and then a right. number of candidates, clergy and lay for president. Right. So right. if a lay person was elected president, um, the clergy person who's running for president or the existing candidate can run for vice president. Okay, the, that's all if, I needed to know. <laughs> yeah, and, and then the reverse, I just wanna be clear too, that right, if, right. if the president is clergy, then we would need, uh, uh, then individuals would have an opportunity to submit their, lay individuals would have their opportunity to, to run for vice president. Okay, on the next day as it as it Exactly, okay. which is why the nominations take place after the, the, the office of president. As a newbie, I just felt sure you had a way to handle this, but I wanted to double. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate that. Thanks a it's lot. It's a good question. It's a good question. So, Michael. Thank you very much. Now, um, I've got two questions, if I may. Just trying to take my hand down. Um, first of all, I'm on uh, I'm Secretary of Committee 19, and this may have been explained six months ago, but how, okay, we're having our last meeting on Saturday. How do I send in the results for that last meeting where we have our recommendations, any amendments we make to our resolutions and all the rest of that? Where does that get submitted? Because I feel like the whole thing is kind of tipped upside down right now. So um, that, that would go, you need to be in contact with the uh, secretariat and they're the ones who process uh, the, the committee reports and that's submitted through the uh, LPO software. So it's, it's the, uh, 
in church terms for those who aren't on committees or involved in that the lpo if you hear people talk about that is the back end that shows everyone what's going on so it's there's a process to submit the resolutions through that and, and file your report in in the lpo um and, and the secretariat can help you with that thank you i mean some of this again i'm sure was explained in the past it's just been so long that it, it becomes very sure. time over time yeah. Uh, the other one is so if we have like dialogue bodies that have been meeting between general conventions, are those in some sense going to be automatically reauthorized or do we need resolutions to go on consent calendar to do the what we would normally do is in every three year reauthorization for uh, any of those bodies that meet. That's that's going to require a two thirds vote. A continuation of a task force requires a two thirds vote and would need to be voted on uh, on the floor. So that cannot be on the consent calendar because it has a different voting requirement. Thank you very much. Uh, Nathan. Uh, thank you. I had a quick question. Um, I wondered if a motion to refer to the next general convention will be given any sort of precedence for consideration, because it seems to me if the House does vote to refer, that sort of potentially um, obviates the need for much further discussion. Yeah, so it would automatically in debate, I mean, because it would be an action on the uh, on the the uh, the resolution in question. So it in debate and then that would be it. Uh, so it, and that's why it's referenced as a secondary motion. So, so you have your main motion and then a motion to refer could then apply to the the whole package, so to speak. If that answers your question. Uh -huh. um, I, I think so. I just want to be so if, if there is like, and this is my first convention, so this may just be oh. me not knowing the queue. Um, so like if there is a deputy that wants to make a motion to refer, like will they get precedence on being called? Oh, in terms of being called? Them? No, not necessarily. Um, it's, it's, it's based on getting to the queue on that. Uh, so it's there, there, there is a queuing system, and we'll, we'll we'll get into the training once we get at the convention on that process. But uh, the president looks at that, alternates between pro and con, and then once that comes up, there'll there'll be a, a flag for other other things. So that that kind of comes up based on what's in the queuing system. Um, Deputy uh, Ambrosi. Yes, my, my name is Benji Ambrogi. Apologize for the weird spelling in the first name. Um, lay deputy from New Hampshire. Can you review the timing of the publication of the consent calendar? Um, just and, and also understanding that a the consent calendar is not debatable. If something requires a one third vote, how does that vote get um, uh, proposed? That do you, if if someone wants to pull something off the consent calendar, um, I, I understand they go to dispatch. But let's say for some reason they're not able to do that. Are they able to stand up and say, I propose take pulling something from the calendar and then a vote will be taken at that time? And, and also, I'm just curious about how much time we're going to have to look at the consent calendar and, and decide which things we want to propose being taken off. Yeah, so, so the process is pretty straightforward is, is once the consent calendar is called, the president will ask if any, if there's any motions, we can't debate the merits of the consent calendar or the merits of removing something from the consent calendar, but okay. someone can move to remove resolution uh, 42 from the consent calendar, and then a vote would be taken immediately on that. Um, okay. That's it. Um, and, and so there, there would be an opportunity you'd queue up and then then get called upon. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, any other live questions? And then um, uh, Emily, I don't know if you had any questions in the chat. I haven't been able to to monitor it very well. Um, that should be addressed on the floor. There were a couple of questions in the chat. Um, that I think have not been um, responded to live yet. Um, one is that there was some early confusion about um, resolution and amendment deadlines. So we should probably carefully reiterate that calendar. Sure. Um, yes. So, and some of that confusion probably comes from June and July having similar sounding months, but June 6th was the deadline to submit resolutions that was published. Now, one of the challenges we have, to be frank, is is the House of Deputies hasn't met, and uh, and the same thing that's happened with with COVID protocols and all of this stuff is we haven't met, and we had to make recommendations uh, that we are presenting to the House on the first day to adopt that deadline. 
Um, and that's June 6 is the, the deadline to submit that we're proposing to submit resolutions. Um, once that is adopted, assuming the House adopts it, uh, then any resolution submitted after that date would be deemed out of order. Um, anything before that date uh, would go through the normal committee process. Uh, the amendment submission date, we wanted to include a, a date that when people could start submitting amendments so we can kind of get everything in order, um, is it starts on July 5th uh, at 12 noon, I believe is, is what the date is in the, um, the, the proposed rule. That date is after that date, you can start submitting amendments to resolutions that are going to come to the floor. Uh, you can do that up until the beginning of the session that that resolution is considered on. And it's just, it, it doesn't matter if it's on the calendar, it doesn't matter where it is, you can just start submitting it as of that date. But we wanted to give everyone a heads up so uh, those in the know didn't have a head start uh, in, in getting their amendment considered and, and pushed forward. So does that, Emily, you think answer the question? I believe so. There is an additional, there's a follow-up part to this, which is, how will people be able to see what amendments or substitutions legislative committees have made before trying to submit an amendment? That'll be in the V binder. Um, so if you go to the, if it's V, the letter V as in Victor, binder.net. Um, once the committee publishes its report, you can look at the resolution and you'll see the committee recommendation and any kind of proposed amendments. Um, that's why we have the cutoff date of June uh, 25th, and once between June 25th and early July, all of those reports will go live. So that's where they can, where you can go and check to see what the committee has recommended. And I see President Jennings has some some uh, comments too as well on that. Actually, I don't have a comment on that. I have a comment on another question. So I'll wait till you're done. Okay. So Emily, does that answer the timing, you think, question? I believe it will have done so. <laughs> OK. Well, let us know if it didn't, and, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to get that answered. And, and then go ahead, and President Jennings. Thank you. I saw a question in the chat from alternate deputy Andy Tomat. I believe you're from Los Angeles. And just wanted to let you know, I'm not sure we've announced this yet, first alternates will be seated in the House of Deputies in what would have been the gallery section. We'll have the same uh, set up as um, the deputies have. You just won't be on the actual floor. So you will have access to the screens. Your V binder will, you know, your iPad will work in the, in the, I think it's Hall F in the swing hall. So uh, we're providing seating in that hall only for the first alternates in um, each order from each diocese. So I just wanted to let you know that. And, 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 and I should just add that we've been in consultation with Dr. Cauldron about uh, having uh, the deputy, alternate deputies there. And I think the, he believes that, that the, the risk, I mean, there's, there's risk for anybody anywhere, but the risk, uh, we think we've minimized it. So, but you're also, if you're not comfortable coming into the hall, you can certainly uh, monitor uh, uh, through um, live stream. And, and just as a, um, uh, on that note too, uh, did you wanna talk about the joint session proposal or for the budget? Yeah. Um, yes, we, um, there were various requests for uh, the House of Bishops to be able to come into the House of Deputies for uh, the joint session on program budget and finance. And uh, I spent a long time thinking about that and consulting with the, um, our public health, my public health consultant, Dr. Rodney Cauldron, uh, what, what um, to have minimal risk we have moved the joint session to the third afternoon, the third legislative day at 2.30, which is about 26 and a half hours before we all leave. So it's very late in what we, what we would call the four day 
infection cycle. So the bishops will be allowed in. They will not be, uh, in, in the past, for those of you who have attended before, um, the bishops came and sat with their deputations. We're, we're not going to permit that. We're going to, they'll be back in the back of the hall uh, in the same section, although socially distant from uh, the, near the alternate deputies. But this will give us an opportunity to follow the canon, which requires a joint session. And we think um, minimizing the risk as much as possible. But that will be the only time that the bishops will be coming into uh, the House of Deputies Hall. And, and so just to reiterate, we anticipate voting on the budget on the third afternoon of the third legislative day uh, following that joint session. So. Uh, it, it's a little different and a little more expedited, but we're hoping to have more information on the budget in advance of convention rather than the normal kind of last minute changes the, that we expect. The budget will, I've spoken with uh, Deputy Mike Emer, who may be on this call, I'm not sure, from Northwest Texas. He's chair of program budget and finance. Bishop Fisher of Texas is the vice chair. And we are sure that the budget will be completed by, uh, I think it's June 30th, within a day or two. So deputies will and bishops will have ample time to review the proposed budget from um, um, program budget and finance. But I would also remind you, because I was paying attention, that any amendments will have to be filed in advance. Is that correct, Mr. Parliamentarian? That is that is correct. So, um, and uh, I'd encourage you if you have comments on the budget or the draft budget as published by council or anything that you see that should be funded or will not funded or anything, get it over to PBNF. And I, I, uh, there's a process in place. Uh, I'm assuming, and I see uh, the chair of PBNF is in here, uh, so I'm assuming he's going to. Call me out if I'm saying anything uh, uh, wrong, but get it over there because uh, it's important to get it before the final budget consideration. Um, it, um, do you want to call on Mike to just speak yeah. to that? How somebody can do that if they wish to. I that that is correct um, in the sense that we want to have a we plan to have the budget done our, our last meeting hopefully will be june 30th and we plan to pass a budget then we need to finalize a little bit of translation and then uh, it will be presented to the uh, to the whole convention um, as far as getting us information um, we have a list of what's what was submitted already if it has funding implications then we have that the general convention office has given us that um, if you've got more things coming up, some of your legislative committees, or if you want to remove something like that, then we, you would, would be helpful if you just let us know. With this, you know, you can email me. My information's up there. Uh, PBNF. You can go through General Convention Office. Patrick Hazel is our um, liaison, and he's always very efficient. So. It wouldn't hurt to send it to us additionally, although we may get it otherwise. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, Emily, do we have any other questions? Um, we, we do have a few more areas of concern. One is uh, with regard to the relationship with the House of Bishops, is the House of Bishops adopting parallel special rules, particularly with regard to deferral? And related to that, if the House of Bishops should vote to defer on something that comes to them in initial action, does the House of Deputies see it or not see it at all? Only items that are, so we if, if the House of Bishops votes on something other than, if it's rejected or take no further action, they're equivalent of that or deferred, we would not see it in the House of House of Deputies uh, by standard practice. Now there's there is a process to pull it, and sometimes that does happen. But the normal practice is unless it's passed or there's a recommendation, say, to refer to a CCAB, it would um, not show up on the floor of the House of Deputies if the House of Bishops is the House of Initial Action. 
Does that answer the question? Uh, and, oh, and, and, and on the first thing, yes, the, the bishops are anticipating doing their own special order. Uh, their rules are a little different in terms of their structure and debate um, and how things function. Uh, so it, it'll be slightly different than ours, but they anticipate having a similar kind of process in place. Thank you. I'm trusting if something else, something doesn't get reiterated in the chat that it's been answered when we bring it up. Um, so uh, there, um, the next questions are a little bit logistical. Um, a question about, uh, is there a provision for deputations unable to attend to weigh in or otherwise comment on resolutions? Um, the, the primary opportunity to comment would be to the legislative committee, um, but uh, it, which anyone in the world can attend a legislative committee hearing uh, and, and participate accordingly. Um, the, uh, as far as on the floor, it's just not technically feasible uh, for us to set up a system uh, to do that at this point. Um, so no, um, there, there won't be if, if, unfortunately we can't pipe, pipe people in, so. Um, it turns out there was an additional element to the um, deferral and House of Bishops question, which is um, Paul Amba specifically asks, um, if referrals need to be concurred, don't deferrals to the 81st convention also have to be concurred? We're anticipating a joint rule of order to, to address that question. So to clarify. Thank you. Um, the, uh, there is a question of logistics, how far apart deputies will be seated on the floor? Yeah, so, so um, essentially, I, I believe uh, in, I know the answer. <laughs> President Jennings, go ahead. Um, the um, General Convention Office staff has been working on this with uh, the floor plan designers. Um, there will be, uh, as I understand it from Dr. Cauldron, the, the biggest problem is breathing in front, not side to side. So. I believe there'll be two to three feet between on the side between deputies, at least two to three. And five and a half to almost six um, in terms of spacing of tables. So we've spread out more than we have in the past. Um, again, we'll, we will require uh, the wearing of masks while you're in the house. The only time when we ask that you do that that you can take your mask off is when you are speaking at a microphone or if you are drinking food. I mean, sorry, drinking liquids. We, we are not going to permit food on the house, on the floor of the House of Deputies because I, you know, I make jokes that uh, sometimes the floor of the house looks like a delicatessen. And if I was ever hungry, I'd just, you know, bring up a, bring up a particular deputation. In fact, some deputations are great because they bring the same treats every year. We're asking you, please don't do that uh, because that's really uh, how, this, how the most spread happens. And, and certainly we hope when you're not on the floor, you'll be cautious in terms of eating in restaurants and all that kind of thing. So um, we're doing the very best we can uh, in terms of social distancing, spacing, masking, um, and uh, limiting uh, food intake. We'll, we will take breaks. I know that our sessions are two and a half, three hours, some of them, and we will make sure to take breaks so that people who uh, need to eat uh, certainly can do so. The other thing is any deputy who needs to tend to personal needs, I'm just gonna say leave the floor and do what you need to do and then come on back. Um, so that's, that's what I know. And I know that uh, we're doing the very best we can to make this as safe as possible. Thank you. And President Jennings, did you also want to mention the reward for committees that, that don't have any resolutions that come to the floor? Can you remind me what I thought I would do? Well, <laughs> in the past, certain legislative committees have wanted to pull items from the consent calendar in order to um, honor the committee's work. So the president has been considering a way oh, to oh, honor. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, yes. Um, 
for those committees who do that, there will be a special reward. I'm not gonna say what that is, but we'll also give an opportunity for uh, the house to recognize in an appropriate way, uh, both the, the officers of the legislative uh, committee as well as having the committee stand so that the whole house can give their thanks. Uh, Ed. If I understood you correctly, there are occasions when legislative committees might have to meet. And if that is the case, when and where? Uh, that will be announced at, at the time in terms of when and where. Uh, there'll be a special space set aside that's socially distanced with, with chairs that are that meet the, the social distancing requirement. Um, and, and details on that would be would be announced. Uh, so the committee would need to talk to the president in terms of um, authorizing that meeting. Yeah. There are four rooms set aside in um, the convention center that are very large rooms that we'll have set up for a committee should they need to meet uh, and, and it'll be socially distanced and cl relatively close to the, to the floor. But what we're, what we're asking committees to not do is to do huddles in the back of the house, which is a time honored tradition where uh, a legislative chair asks, you know, we'll huddle in the back over by, you know, the, the north entrance. We're, we're not gonna do that just because of, it's just huddling is not good, not safe. So we'll provide alternative space. Uh, it's like... I, I have a question. Yes. Um, so I, I, I understand that we're not having any social gatherings, but I see that on the last night there is the um, Diocese of Maryland night. Um, is that not a social gathering? Yeah, it's after adjournment. Yes. I I'm sorry. Since Brian is um, on the design group, you want to say more about that? Yeah, so th there was some discussion on that. Uh, the, the primary reason why it's at that point is because the risk is substantially lower uh, by the time we reach that time. Uh, because the, the advice from Dr. Cauldron was that if we were to do something, a gathering, whether it's the joint session, which is what President Jennings was mentioning, that's why it's taking place so late, or Diocese of Maryland night, um, that it occur at the end of the convention rather than the beginning of the convention to minimize minimize that. And let me add that the Diocese of Maryland has multiple venues for Maryland night. So it's not, you know, a thousand people in one space. They have multiple options that, you, that you'll be able to sign up for. And I'm sure they'll be uh, providing more information about that. And it's optional too. It's not required for any attendee, and nor will we be regathering as a group. So it's it's we um, Maryland has has been through a lot, and and it, it's not kind of ideal. Um, so this we felt was the best balance between allowing people the opportunity if they wanted to and chose to without uh, affecting the participants of those who choose not to, or participation of those who choose not to to go. We did have a couple of um, questions about schedule uh, earlier that have not been specifically answered. One is when will the nominations, when will the result of nominations be posted so that we see um, who is running for which office? That, that's already been posted in the blue book from the report of the Joint Standing Committee on Nominations. You can go to the uh, general convention website, look under publications and resources for the blue book, and uh, you will find all nominations by the Joint Standing Committee on nominations in their report. And nominations from the floor, if there are any addition one, additional ones that qualify or, or meet the qualification requirements would be published on, on the first legislative day. Let me just add what I what I just spoke about does not apply to president and vice president of the house. 
Uh, as you know, a number of people have declared their candidacies. However, there are other people who did submit their names for the background checks and the candidate forums and the written materials were optional. And uh, that's, um, and anyone who uh, wishes to run and who has completed the background check, um, well, there's a deadline to declare their nomination. Uh, I think it's the first day for president and the end of the second day for vice president, once we know uh, which order the ele president elect comes from. Well, I see the chair. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to respond to uh, Gay's comment about the nominations. Given that that process started so long ago, we had a couple of withdrawals and replacements. So there's some people whose name, some people in the Blue Book report who withdrew and they've been replaced with other folks. So we need to probably figure out where to get a new list for folks. Have those, have those changes been publicized yet? I don't think they've been publicized. G GCO is aware of them and they've, you know, they've got the records on it, but. Okay, could you check with them, Scott, as chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Nominations so that we can inform the House? Yes, I right. will. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And, and let me just say, Scott's done a great job and uh, some of the deputies who served on that are on here as well. And um, thank you so much to the Joint Standing Committee on Nominations. Anything else, Emily? That... Um, there are a couple that are specific to the operations of legislative committees. So if there aren't other questions, I think we should go to those. Um, and one is um, whether legislative committees are able to vote themselves to remove items from the consent calendar rather than going through dispatch or the floor. In this convention, no, uh, it would be dispatch and, and the president or the uh, um, uh, the floor would would be necessary to remove an item from the consent calendar. Thank you. And then, um, is it? Can you describe for those working on legislative committees uh, when they need those committees that have House of Bishops as initial action? When do our deputies legislative committees need to file their reports on that. Is it before July 5th or is it um, during the um, convention when the House of Bishops is finished with it? As soon as possible, so yes. Uh, and then if there are changes that then the committee would need to file a new report, but absent a change on, on the floor of the House of Bishops, the report would stand. So yes, all committees need to get their reports in early. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One is it lets dispatch build the calendar. Two is it lets deputies know what's being proposed so they can you know, reflect on it and, and propose or consider their amendments. Um, and if, if we hold off on that, other, it's, deputies won't know in terms of what they may or may not want to, to propose as an amendment. Uh, and, and three, it lets the full resolution review process take place. So if there's proposed amendments or changes or anything like that, that may affect uh, the canons, polity, all of that stuff. It, it's, we, we need to get that stuff in as soon as possible. So that way everyone can come prepared and, and buckle down. So. I think that is everything I have seen in the chat other than a couple of questions um, that might be uh, answered by the um, by the support team about saving the chat and when the recording is available um, and questions for the Diocese of Maryland about uh, about registering for Maryland night, which is not, I think, something that we can answer in this meeting. I actually think Scott Slater uh, from the Diocese of Maryland has already posted about two venues, and maybe he has something to say about registration. Yeah, I included the link. I included the link in the in my chat response, and it, it should Great. be going out to both um, houses this week, I hope. Great. Thank, and thank you, Scott, and thank you for all your hard work and people in the Diocese of Maryland. It's amazing. Thank you.
the, the last question I see is whether there's an opportunity to celebrate the retiring president. I have a countdown clock. <laughs> I, I'm probably not the right person to answer that question. There, there will be an opportunity, yes. <laughs> If I, have, um, if I have missed any, I apologize. A lot of things did go by quickly, but I think we got. Uh, so if, if I have missed your question, please raise your hand now. Paul. Thank you. The, um, the, the special rules are talking about a cutoff of June 25th for committee reports, but we have the previous announced date was the 27th. And I see that we have uh, prayer book liturgy and music is scheduled for the 27th, quite a few resolutions. Uh, can that be amended in the special rules? We'll, we'll figure that out. So, so that should not be an obstacle uh, for those, but yes, we'll figure that out. Elliot? Uh, yes, not so much uh, on behalf of myself, but uh, someone had asked about saving a chat, not how could they save the chat, but will the whole chat be saved because they had to leave early? Ah, uh, we can do that, absolutely, and we can make that available on the page where we have the video as a file to download. That's a great question. Uh -huh. Anything else? Well, thank you all. Thank you all for your ministry and your work and your contributions uh, to the, the good governance and order of the church. Um, really appreciate it. And for your patience with all the, the last minute changes communications. I, I know it's disruptive, and um, it, but we really appreciate all of you rising to the challenge. So thank you for that. Go in peace. <laughs> Thank you, Amen. everyone. See you in a few weeks in Baltimore. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. God bless. <laughs>